I stood barefoot on the sand and looked out at the Pacific Ocean. The setting sun painted Playa Hermosa a golden color. Even the palm trees behind me took on a golden hue. I closed my eyes for a moment and thought about how I ended up here. As the Grateful Dead song goes, what a long, strange trip it's been. Six months earlier. Renee. Mary Margaret. The two stylishly dressed young women squealed and rushed to hug each other, while the restaurant hostess watched them with interest. When they finished greeting each other, she led them to a table in the back of the cafe. Even though it was May, the temperature in Houston had already risen to 80 degrees, and the corresponding humidity made air conditioning a necessity. I wonder how many hours one must spend in the gym to achieve a figure like theirs. The hostess thought enviously as she seated her customers. I was so glad you called, Mary Margaret, the short blonde purred. It's been ages since you've come here. I know, the tall brunette replied. Starting my own advertising agency has taken much longer than I could have imagined. Honestly, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't called a potential client. But since I called, I couldn't pass up the chance to see my former college roommate. Yeah, and I couldn't miss the chance to see my maid of honor again. It's been too long, girlfriend. The waiter interrupted them by bringing two glasses of white wine, and after he took their lunch orders, Mary Margaret tilted her head and asked, So what do you think of the legal profession? A broad smile appeared on Renee's face. Terrific. Baker, Norton, and Vincent is the biggest law firm in town. I get a great salary plus a huge bonus from last year, and I'm well positioned to make partner. Wow, I thought I was doing well. Sorry, I didn't mean to brag. What about you? How's your agency doing? The brunette smiled tokenistically. Well, since we're bragging here, my little agency is the hottest creative shop in Dallas. What's more, she said, lowering her tone. I signed a contract last night to advertise in the Southwest region for one of the big oil companies. Our billings to them next year will run into the millions. Renee nodded approvingly. I always knew you'd be a star, girl. They ate their salads in silence for a few minutes. Then Renee looked at her friend curiously. You didn't say anything about romance. How's your love life? Mary Margaret sighed. Honestly, there's not much to talk about. The dating scene is getting tiresome. These dating services are useless. I'd have better luck finding a unicorn than someone like your handsome husband. She noticed Renee avert her eyes for a moment. Hey, what's going on, neighbor? Are you and your husband having problems? Now the blonde was clearly feeling uncomfortable. She sighed, took a sip from her wine glass, and then looked up at her friend. I really want to tell someone, Mary Margaret, but you have to promise me it will be strictly confidential. Of course. Now tell me what's going on. Renee took a deep breath, then in a low whisper blurted out, I'm having an affair. Really? I'm shocked. I thought you and Robert were the perfect couple. She leaned closer. What's wrong? Isn't he that good? Renee shook her head dismissively. No, that's not the problem. It's just that, honestly, she shrugged, Robert's turned into a real disappointment. Why? Mary Margaret leaned back in her chair, surprised at the abruptness of her friend's statement. Remember I told you about the deal Robert made to become general counsel for his old company and how it fell through? It was frustrating enough as it was, and now he's decided to hang up his sign and go into independent practice. Her friend frowned. If he's so passionate about the law, why doesn't he take it up? Seems like a pretty bold move to me. You wouldn't say that if you'd seen him. He's pathetic. He works in a tiny office he rents in a rundown shopping center. He barely has enough hours to cover his expenses, much less bring anything home and yet I'm the one who supports us. Mary Margaret raised one eyebrow. I seem to remember him doing the same for you when you were finishing law school. Renee shook her head impatiently. Yes, but that was different. I knew I would succeed as soon as I graduated, and I did. She frowned. But Robert's just banging his head against the wall. His law firm won't be any different than all the other crooks who chase ambulances to attract business. Truth be told, I'm embarrassed when anyone from my firm, or anyone for that matter, asks me about him. She stared off into the distance. I used to think that together we'd go far and actually accomplish something in life. But honestly, I've left him behind, and he'll never catch up. She sighed. I've outgrown him, Mary Margaret. It's time to move on. Mary Margaret sat in silence, digesting her lunch and her friend's revelations. After a few minutes, she took another sip of wine and looked at her friend inquisitively. So who is the other man in your life? Renee leaned forward and whispered. That's my boss at Baker Norton. He's already a partner, and there's talk in the corridors that he's going to be senior partner when old man Baker retires. Sounds like you're aiming high. How long has this affair been going on? About six months, I think. He's crazy about me. He wants to marry me as soon as he can leave his wife. Hmm, so you both have an inconvenient spouse. 
Yes, but Vance has a prenup with her, so getting out of the marriage won't be too expensive for him. What about you and Robert? Are you going to divorce him? Renee's face sank. That's the problem. We haven't even considered a prenup. As things stand now, if we split up, I'll probably have to pay alimony to Robert, and I won't stand for that. I don't intend to fund his pathetic law firm for the rest of my life. Mary Margaret shook her head. You know you're playing a dangerous game, friend. Texas is not a guilt-free state. If he catches you in bed, he'll probably charge you a lot more than just alimony. Renee looked at her friend in despair. Refresh my memory. Which one of us has a law degree? Then she smiled to take the edge off her sarcasm. Anyway, I'll figure something out. Three weeks later. Unfortunately, I didn't find out about the conversation with my wife until much later. Too late to do anything about it. All I knew for sure that May morning was that neither my personal nor my professional life was working out the way I had planned. I was in a somber mood as I pulled up to a small shopping center and parked my car in one of my assigned curbside spots. As I closed the door, I noticed a for rent sign in the window of one of the stores at the other end of the center. Wasn't that where that little craft and candle store was located? Damn, looks like they didn't make it. I shook my head, hoping a similar fate wouldn't befall my law practice. Walking to the door to my office, I ran my fingers over the plaque affixed to the wall. Robert L. Wilson, ESQ. Attorney at law. The plaque was plastic, but it looked a little like bronze. Maybe someday they'll make me one just like it, engraved in marble. All was quiet inside, but it was seven in the morning, so what did I expect? I'd always had a habit of getting to work early. There was no reason to change it now. I checked my phone, but none of the potential clients had left messages. I sighed and sank into my chair. Reaching into my desk drawer, I pulled out the folder of paperwork for the contract I was preparing for the client. It was pretty straightforward, but there was no reason not to check everything again, just to make sure. I have time, that's for sure. After a few minutes, however, I dropped my pen on the desk and leaned back in my chair with a sigh. If only things had worked out at Alliance. I was an operations manager for Allied Fluid Dynamics, a large regional supplier of components for oil and gas pipelines. I was doing well. I was making good money and was in line for a more responsible job. Then Ben Masterson, the president of the company, called me into his office with an interesting proposition. Robert, Phil Larson came to see me yesterday. He wanted to give me advance notice that he plans to retire in a few years and that Allied will need to find a new general counsel. I hadn't heard that news. Phil was a bit old-fashioned in dress and manners, but he kept the company's legal affairs on track. Not always an easy task in the rough and tumble oil industry. He and I weren't close, but I respected him. Ben couldn't stand it. Phil also had a bit of advice for me. He told me we had three options for replacing him. The first is to outsource all of our legal work to an outside law firm. If we did that, he told me, it would cost us a fortune, and it would take them at least two or three years to learn the business well enough to be effective. The second option he suggested was to hire some savvy lawyer and teach him the business. It would not be easy to do, and again it would take a long time to learn. And finally, Phil said, we could find someone on our staff who knows our business inside and out and send them to law school. I nodded. You know, Ben, that last option actually makes a lot of sense. Our business is pretty unique and I'm willing to bet that it would take less time to learn the law, at least in the areas we need, than it would to figure out the ins and outs of this crazy industry. Ben grinned. I was hoping you'd say that because the guy Phil recommended was you. E, I'm the operations manager. I could never do what Phil does. Phil thinks otherwise. He told me he thinks you're perfect, that you have a penchant for the law. Ben must have read the look on my face because he stopped me before I could object. Of course the company will pay for all of your tuition. We want you to take courses in the evenings and not be distracted by operational work. It won't be easy, but if you do well, you'll be in a top-level management position at a much younger age than you might otherwise expect. What do you think? I think I should punch Phil Larson in the face, I replied with a laugh. Seriously, Ben, it's not something I've even considered. Regardless, I need to get home and discuss this with my wife. He couldn't argue with that, so I went home and told Rena about the possibility. To my surprise, she was all for it. That's great, honey, she enthused. You'll go from that boring middle management job right into the executive's office. And if they put you on the board of directors like Phil, you'll probably get some big stock options. Maybe, but that would put me outside my comfort zone. The thought of going back to school is pretty daunting. Oh, don't worry about that. You're smart enough to handle the coursework. And besides, you'll only have to focus on contracts and regulations. Certainly not criminal law. Anyway, I've been through all that before, so I can help you if you get stuck. 
Come on, Han, this is the chance of a lifetime. You've got to do it. Okay, if you're up for it, then so am I. Wonderful, she squealed. My friends will be so jealous. That's how I began my legal career. When I enrolled in the part-time program at the University of Houston Law Center, I learned that I would be studying year-round for four years. I would take courses in the evenings, taking 10 credits per semester while continuing to work at Allied. In addition, Masterson told me I would have to find and train a successor to take over my job. It was a killer workload, and several times I questioned my sanity. Too often I made do with little sleep and coffee. Worse, I hardly had any time to socialize with Renee. As it turned out, it was bound to happen anyway. After graduating from law school, Renee was hired at Baker, Norton & Vinson, the largest law firm in Houston. She was now working the same number of hours a week as I was, including school. There were weeks when we only saw each other for a couple hours. But each time, we agreed that the pain and separation would be worth it in the end. Most of these discussions took place after we had driven each other to exhaustion. Despite my doubts and occasional bouts of burnout, I made it through, and the pride I felt on graduation day was proof that I had made the right decision. Of course, there was still one hurdle to overcome, the bar exam. So on the Monday after graduation, I returned to the auditorium and spent two days studying for the grueling 12-hour exam. Three months later, when I saw my name on the list of those who had passed the exam, I was over the moon. When Ben Masterson called me into his office the following Monday, I was energized and ready to begin my new duties. Despite my excitement, however, I couldn't help but notice the unsmiling expression on Ben's face as I sat down in front of his desk. Robert, he said in a somber voice, I don't know any other way to handle this other than to tell you straight. The board met over the weekend and voted to accept an offer from Kinder Morgan to buy us. They want to proceed with the takeover immediately, so next week Allied will become a subsidiary of theirs. I was stunned. I hadn't heard even a whisper of such a possibility. What does that mean for all of us? I'm going to retire, as are most of the other directors. By next week, KM will have a new management team in place to take over current operations. I grabbed the edge of his desk to steady myself. How will that affect my role? He couldn't look me in the eye. I'm sorry, Robert. Kinder Morgan's subsidiaries don't have in-house legal counsel. So I'm fired? He wrinkled his nose. No, of course not. The general counsel position becomes redundant, but you'll have the opportunity to return as operations manager. Of course, you'll have to let young Stearns go. I thought of the clear-eyed engineer I was grooming as my successor, and she had just gotten married. I can't do that, Ben. Not after the last four years. Leave Stearns and let me go. That's what I thought you'd say, Robert. He shook his head sadly. This merger will be good for the company and many of our people, but not for everyone. I'm sorry. He stood up to let me know the meeting was over. If you go to Human Resources, they'll help you make all the arrangements. He held out his hand, and I reluctantly shook it. I'm really sorry, Robert. This isn't what I envisioned when we set out on this path four years ago. And just like that, I became unemployed. I was given severance pay and benefits for six months but that was pretty cold comfort when I remembered my high expectations. Renee was devastated when I broke the news to her. How could they do this to you, especially after all those extra hours you worked at their request? It's just wrong. I agreed, but there was nothing I could say to reassure her or myself. It was just business, and I was just collateral damage. Are you going to start looking for a job in the oil industry? She asked. You still have a lot of contacts there, don't you? Not anymore. I got so buried in law school that I've lost touch with a lot of my old colleagues. Besides, the price of oil has dropped a lot this year, so they're not hiring. Then what are you going to do? I didn't spend the last four years of my life in law school just to throw it away. I'm going to start looking for a job as a lawyer. Don't be silly, Sweet Baker. Norton won't hire you. They only take rookies. It's the same at the other big firms. Unless you have special legal knowledge or big clients you can bring with you, your chances of getting a job at one of them are pretty slim. Then I'll start my own firm if I have to, I said stubbornly. She left the conversation, probably hoping I'd drop the idea once I'd had a chance to think it over. But two weeks later, when she found out that I had used my severance pay to sign a lease for office space in the mall, she became outright negative. This place is a disgrace, Robert. Working at this address, you'll never build up a respectable clientele. Just watch me, I vowed. Looking back, I think that's when our marriage really started to go downhill. Renee tried to hide her displeasure with my fancy plan, but she openly resented having to take on a larger share of my living expenses. I didn't like it either, but I couldn't convince her that the situation was temporary. Moreover, she was clearly embarrassed when friends and co-workers asked about my endeavor. 
She spoke about it only in generalities and quickly tried to change the subject. She practically needed a subpoena to give me the address of my new office. Our friends were sympathetic, but it was easy to hear the reservations in their voices. As a result, I backed off even further to avoid the inevitable, how's the practice going, questions. Renee's star, on the other hand, continued to rise. She was getting more and more hours and attracting big clients in the process. When we met with people from Baker Norton, all they would talk about was how well Renee was doing and how great her partnership prospects were. This meant that we were under no monetary pressure, even though I had lost income. On the other hand, her successes, combined with her resentment towards me, meant that she was spending more and more time in the office. Such was the case at the end of May, when Hurricane Maddie hit. I was reviewing one of my few cases when I heard the front door open. I hurried out of the office and saw a young, well-dressed African-American woman. She looked to be in her early 20s, and the jacket and skirt she was wearing showed off a slim, athletic figure. I remember wondering if she had been involved in college athletics. But the most remarkable thing about her was her hair. She wore it long and natural, and it hung down below her shoulders, framing her beautiful caramel-colored face with an ebony flow. Please let her be a paying client, I thought, introducing myself and ushering her into my Spartan office. When we were seated, I adopted my most professional expression and said, So how can I help you today, miss? She quickly reached across the desk to shake my hand, and her face spread into a smile that seemed to raise the light level in the room. I'm Madison Armstrong, but everyone calls me Maddie. I'm not looking for your help. I'm here to help you. Before I could respond, she picked up the folder of papers she'd brought with her and held it out across the table. I just finished my first year at the University of Houston Law Center, as you'll see, with excellent grades. I am now ready to spend the summer as your legal intern. This was not what I expected. To give myself some time before I let her down, I opened her folder and looked through it. She was doing well. Honor Society in undergraduate school, high LSAT scores, top 10% of her law class in her first year. And then I realized something was wrong. Aren't you a little late to start looking for internships? And with those grades, shouldn't you be interviewing at one of the big law firms downtown? Her radiant smile faded for a moment. You're right, of course. To be honest, I had an internship scheduled at Baker, Norton, and Vincent, but just last week they sent me an email saying there had been a mix-up and they didn't have room for me. I bet one of the partners had met with her and changed her mind. I shook my head sympathetically. I don't know much about that firm. I guess you could say they're a little... monochromatic. Her wide smile returned again. Well, their loss is your gain. Besides, I'd rather get real-world experience than spend my summer delivering lattes and filing papers. I want to work with real people with everyday problems that you probably face all the time. I couldn't help but admire her courage, but I realized I had no choice. I'm sorry, Miss Armstrong, but I can't hire you. Anger flashed in her eyes and I hurried to continue. No, no, it's not what you think. Look, I'd love to have someone with your credentials and your attitude helping me out here. But look around you, it's pretty obvious I'm barely afloat. There's no way I can pay you even an intern's salary. I'm sorry. She looked at me carefully and then her smile shone brighter than ever. Then it's settled. I'll work for free. I'll just stretch my student loans to cover my living expenses over the summer. She winked at me. Besides, I really like ramen noodles. Wait, wait, I can't do that. I'd be taking advantage of you. It wouldn't be fair. A determined expression appeared on her face. You can't take advantage of me if I know in advance what you're offering and agree to it. Besides, her eyes were pleading now, I really need experience and credentials. And Dr. Goldstein said you're a good guy I could learn from. I remembered Goldstein. I'd taken his forensics class and he'd been tough on me. I was surprised he remembered it all, much less recommended me. I hope I won't regret it. I stood up and extended my hand to her. So, Miss Armstrong, you are my new summer intern. She gave a little shriek and jumped up to shake my hand. Thank you, Squire. You won't regret it. I shook my head when she called me Squire and then laughed when I realized what it meant. You must have misunderstood my sign outside. My name is Wilson Robert Wilson. Esquire is just an old-fashioned term for lawyer. Oh, I know that, she laughed. When I was growing up, my father was a lawyer in our little town, and everyone called him Squire. I guess it just stuck with me. Well, it's Robert or Mr. Wilson if we have a client coming in. Now, I let her out of my office. You can set up over there, but I'm afraid I don't have a desk or chair for you. She looked around, not the least bit embarrassed. Not a problem. Is it okay if I use your network connection? I have a laptop in my car. When I nodded, she slipped out the door and returned a moment later. Settling into the chair that served as the reception area, she began to work the keyboard and mouse in a businesslike manner. 
While I watched her with interest, she quickly finished her work, made a few notes on her cell phone, and then looked up at me. Is it okay if I don't start until an hour later? I grinned. What am I going to do, take away your paycheck? She laughed and hurried out the door. An hour and a half passed before she returned. I heard the sound of a heavy engine outside and went to the door to see what was the matter. She was just jumping off the cab of a big F-150. When she saw me looking, she waved her hand and invited me to come over. That's my brother's truck, Squire. He let me borrow it. I started to correct her, but I was so curious I decided it could wait. She walked me to the back of the pickup truck, and when she opened the back door, I saw a nice-looking office desk. Where did you buy it? From Craigslist, she replied. Seeing my face, she hurried onward. Don't worry, it was free. Some company was going out of business and was offering their furniture to anyone who would take it. I also bought a chair. Can you help me get them in? The table wasn't that big, but I was still amazed at how easily Maddie handled her part of the load. Definitely an athlete, I decided. While she went to pick up her brother's stuff, I went back into the house and stood there bewildered by what had just happened. Definitely not how I expected my morning to go, I said to the new office furniture. Forty-five minutes later, she burst into the office. I'm back, Squire. Now we can get to work. And before I could remember to correct her about my name, Hurricane Maddie let the winds of change blow through my life. By the end of the first week, she had completely reorganized my file cabinet. This was a very good thing because I didn't really have any system in place. Since there weren't many clients, I preferred to spread the folders out in any available space. When Maddie realized what I was doing, she didn't say anything. But the next day, I found a new filing cabinet in my office with all my clients alphabetized and neatly stacked. Free on Craigslist, she confirmed in response to my unasked question. My schedule was next in line. Soon, she was already synchronizing the calendar on my computer with my phone and her computer. If we ever get a bunch of clients, I thought wryly, Maddie will make sure we never miss an appointment. Then she tied it all together with my billing system. Organization wasn't her only talent. She also proved to be a wizard when it came to research, flipping through statutes, discovering case law, ferreting out little things that could help our clients' cases. I had always prided myself on my abilities, but she put me to shame. Once she understood how we were organized, Maddie focused her attention on our clients and their needs. She wanted to know everything about them, and I was happy to let her read their cases and point out the relevant laws. After she dealt with their issues, she would come to my office with questions. She was especially interested in why I handled their case the way I did. Now I began to feel like I was giving her something valuable, training on how a lawyer approaches a case. She quickly realized that practicing law in the real world is not as simple and straightforward as they teach in school. When we weren't working with a client, she would bring her law books and we would discuss cases. I was impressed with the amount of case law she had already absorbed, and I think she was impressed with the way I analyzed the issues. I enjoyed our classes and the days went by much faster. I had already told Renee about Maddie and the idea amused her. One day she came into my office and I introduced Maddie to her. Renee barely managed to hide her amusement when she heard Maddie call me Squire. That night at home, Renee couldn't stop teasing me about my buddy. I told her about Maddie's grades and her LSAT scores, but Renee wasn't impressed. It annoyed me. She'd be an intern at your firm if Baker Norton hadn't turned down her offer, I remarked. Good thing we turned it down, she grinned. I can imagine the commotion she would have caused walking down the halls with that mop of hair. Well, I think it suits her, and I can tell you that underneath that hair is one bright mind. As far as I'm concerned, Baker, losing Norton is my good fortune. Renee rolled her eyes and changed the subject. As the Houston summer unfolded with steadily rising temperatures and humidity, life in the Wilson household grew colder. Whereas Renee had once been intolerant of me and my attempts to start my own law practice, she was now indifferent. When I tried to tell her about a new client or an amusing anecdote about Maddie, she clearly wasn't paying attention. When I suggested going out for a drink or dinner, she always had work to do. By the end of July, we saw each other only rarely. Our life together was nothing but a memory. The situation became so tense that one day when Maddie asked me another question about a procedure, I lashed out at her. She stood up silently and walked out of my office. I sat there for a minute, letting my anger spill out. Then I walked out and sat down next to her desk. Can I talk to you for a minute, Maddie? I asked, trying to get her attention. She didn't look at me. Of course you can, you're the boss. Maddie, I apologize. You didn't do anything wrong by asking those questions. In fact, I'm glad you're so eager to learn. The truth is, the problem is me. I sighed and my shoulders slumped. I can tell you this. Renee and I are going through some bad times and I probably took it out on you. 
I'm sorry. She looked at me with concern. What's going on, Squire? I laid out the whole story to her about how Renee had become disillusioned with me and how our relationship had cooled. It's probably my fault. I was so stubborn in my desire to succeed as a lawyer that I ignored the obvious. I'm just not good enough to make it work. No, she said sharply. You had a goal, and you were determined to accomplish it. I don't know how things will turn out, but I know you're a damn good lawyer. I've already learned a lot from you. I appreciate your loyalty, Maddie, but I'm sure Renee doesn't share that opinion. She gave me an appraising look. Looks like things aren't going well in the romance department either. I smiled crookedly. The only way to see romance these days is to turn on the Hallmark Channel. She reached out and squeezed my hand. Things will work out, Squire. I'm just sure of it. Then she realized what she'd done and yanked her hand away. I had to smile. Thanks for the pep talk, Maddie. Now I'd better get back to Coulson's suit. That was how we parted ways. I tried not to bring up my home life at the office again, and Maddie tried not to touch on anything personal. We both knew what the other was doing. It went on like that until the beginning of August. Late one morning, I was working at my desk when I heard the front doorbell ring. Maddie, who among other things had taken on the role of secretary, went to see who it was. A minute later, she was standing at my office door with a strange expression on her face. Squire, you have a visitor. She says it's a private matter. As I stood up to greet the visitor, Renee's former college roommate walked through the door. Mary Margaret, haven't seen you in ages. How are you? Are you still in Dallas? I'm still working in Dallas, but I came here for the day. My meeting ended earlier than I expected, so I thought I'd take a chance and see if you could have lunch. I pretended to look at my schedule. Sure, that would be great. Do you want me to try to get Renee to join us? Actually, I met her last time I was here. I thought I'd try to do the same with you this time. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, let's do it. I led her out to the reception area. Meet Madison Armstrong, who is interning with me this summer. Maddie, meet Mary Margaret Olson, an old friend of Renee and me. We're going to go out to lunch. Can you look after her while I'm away? Of course, Squire, she said, and held out her hand to Mary Margaret. Nice to meet you, Miss Olson. Then she returned to her desk. As Mary Margaret and I walked out the door, something struck me as odd. Maddie wasn't smiling, I realized. At that moment, Mary Margaret grabbed my arm and giggled. What's with the squire, Robert? I rolled my eyes. It's just Maddie. It's a long story. Mary Margaret drove me to a charming little bistro a little farther than I expected. But the food was worth the trip. Over lunch and a couple glasses of wine, we learned about each other's lives and reminisced about old college buddies. The conversation was pleasant, but I couldn't escape the feeling of unease. We were friends, but Mary Margaret was much closer to Renee than I was. My discomfort increased when the waiter removed our plates, and Mary Margaret looked me carefully in the eye. So how are you and Renee doing these days? Um, fine, all good. Why do you ask? She waved her hand dismissively. Oh, nothing much. It's just that Renee mentioned that setting up your firm was taking up all the energy, and I understand her own workload has increased as well. I was just worried about you guys. What did Renee tell her about us? It's been a little stressful at times, but we'll get through it. She smiled slightly. You know, when you and Renee first started dating, I was very impressed with you. I thought she had a very good reputation then, and I still do. I hope she never forgets that. I sat in silence, not knowing what to say back. It seemed like something else was going on, but I couldn't figure out what. We drove back to my office, making pleasant chit-chat. But no sooner had I gotten out of the car than she reached out and squeezed my palm. I care for you very much, Robert. Please stay in touch. And if you ever want to talk, you know how to reach me. With those words, she leaned over and gave me a quick kiss on the cheek. I waved goodbye to her and walked into the office where I ran into Maddie. So, how was lunch? She asked indifferently. It was okay. It was nice to get a chance to socialize with each other and talk about college. A whole two hours? I took a quick glance at my watch and marveled. I guess time got away from me. Maddie looked at me strangely. Be careful with her. She's got hungry eyes. Don't be silly, Maddie. She's Renee's best friend. She's not interested in me. I'm just saying, Squire. With those words, she went back to her desk, and I did the same. But it took me a while to focus on my work. What a strange conversation. Was she really hitting on me? And if so, why now? That's weird. I finally decided to tell Renee about our dinner, so she wouldn't think I was hiding something from her. But she was late for a meeting at work that night, and by the time she got home, I had given up and gone to bed. In my annoyance, I forgot to tell her about my dinner guest. If I had been annoyed before, the following week I became downright pessimistic about my marriage prospects. 
I was hoping we could do something together, but Renee turned out to be busy both Saturday and Sunday. She called me Monday morning to give me even more discouraging news. We have just begun negotiations on a major acquisition for a client. I can't tell you who's involved, but I guarantee you'll read about it in the Wall Street Journal when it's finalized. Anyway, the negotiations are taking place at the Hotel Alessandra, and since we'll probably be working around the clock to meet the deadline, the firm has reserved a block of rooms for us. As a result, I probably won't be able to be home much this week. The way things had been going lately, I probably wouldn't even notice it, I thought bitterly. But I didn't bother telling her. I worked late that night and then went out and treated myself to dinner at a nice restaurant. I hoped Renee would be there when I got home at 11 o'clock, but she wasn't, and she wasn't there by the time I got up the next morning. I might as well have taken off my wedding ring, I thought angrily as I drove to the office. I'm single in every way except my name. Nevertheless, I tried to keep my anger from affecting my attitude toward Maddie. Late that afternoon, I heard the front doorbell ring, and a minute later, Maddie appeared in my office doorway. There's a new client to see you, Squire, she announced, eyes wide. What had gotten into her? When I stood up to greet the visitor, I realized. Maddie had brought one of the most attractive women I'd ever seen in real life. She had model cheekbones accentuated by long blonde hair that was tucked behind one ear and flowed down the other side of her face. The blouse and jacket she wore did nothing to hide her developed bust, and the pencil skirt was short enough to expose her long, shapely legs. She could be a supermodel, I thought, and judging by the look on Maddie's face, she was shocked too. As I stood there fluttering my tongue, the woman stepped forward confidently and shook my hand. Mr. Wilson, I'm Amber Thompson. I apologize for barging in on you like this, but I have very little time. In a nutshell, I intend to divorce my husband and would like to engage you as my attorney. With these words, she reached into the patent leather purse she carried with her and pulled out a check. Here is $2,000 for my fee. If that's not enough, just let me know and I'll be happy to revise the amount. No, 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 that's quite satisfactory, Mrs. Thompson. Why don't you sit down so we can discuss the details of your situation? I managed to say, gesturing to a chair. She smiled and shook her head. Again, I apologize, but I don't have time for that today. All I wanted to do today was to make sure you wouldn't refuse my services. If your schedule allows, I would like to meet with you at the same time tomorrow to discuss my case with you. I pretended to check my calendar, but knew that whenever this goddess wanted to meet, I would do my best to please her. Tomorrow afternoon will be just fine, I assured her. That's wonderful, she sighed. I look forward to working with you. She then turned and walked out of my office, but not before I noted that her figure was as attractive from behind as it was from the front. After Amber left, Maddie walked in and stared at me. So I guess she had to rush back to Victoria's Secret to finish the photo shoot, huh? I didn't want to say anything that might offend Maddie. I don't know about that, but she was definitely a head taller than most of our clients, I replied. Maddie laughed lightly and walked back to her desk, but not before stopping and giving me a long look. I didn't want to admit it to Maddie, but Amber really got me. I'd met attractive women before, but none of them compared to Amber. That night I came home and ate some leftovers and then settled in front of the TV. I was flipping through the channels when I came across one of those movies that cable channels often spun. The blonde girl made me think of Amber, and I felt myself tense up in response. Damn, it's been a long time, I thought resentfully. After watching for only a few minutes, I turned off the TV and walked over to my computer. In a flash, I opened a website, and within minutes I found a clip of a blonde girl who looked a lot like Amber doing it. A little embarrassed, I cleaned myself up and went to bed. The next morning I got up and showered, then spent extra time tidying up and picking out my best suit and tie. Suddenly, I realized I was humming as I drove to work and I shook my head in disgust. You're acting like a teenager on a date. You're a married man and Amber is a client. Get a grip, Wilson. But the memory of Amber standing in the doorway wouldn't go away, and my libido kept whispering that my wife was conveniently off to the side. Trouble, trouble, my conscience warned. The day was busy enough to occupy my attention, but as the time of our meeting approached, I began checking the clock on my phone frequently. When it was finally half past three and Amber still hadn't shown up, I was overcome with disappointment. Fifteen minutes later, I got up to look outside, but Amber was still gone. When I returned, Maddie smirked but didn't say anything. At that moment, the phone rang, and as I answered it, I heard Amber's melodic voice. Robert, it seems like all I'm doing is apologizing to you. I'm running late at work. Is there any chance you could meet me somewhere in the neighborhood? Of course I can do that. Where would you like to meet? You don't happen to like jazz, do you? I like a place called The Downbeat where we can have a drink and talk. I was pleasantly surprised. 
I love jazz, and the downbeat is my favorite place in Houston. I can be there in an hour. Great, then I'll see you there. I was putting my desk in order when Maddie walked in. So you have a date, Squire? I frowned. I have a meeting with a client, not a date. Were you listening to my conversation? She folded her arms. It's really hard not to listen when you're talking so loud. Look, she was just stuck at work and couldn't get out. We'll meet somewhere near her office and talk about her case. She nodded. Then her face took on an expression I couldn't read. Just be careful, Squire. I promise, Maddie, I assured her, heading for the door. Downbeat Restaurant is located in an up-and-coming neighborhood in Houston that's full of little stores, bars, and eateries. It's almost always crowded, but I was lucky enough to pull into the parking lot just as someone was leaving. I walked up the stairs to the club and looked around for Amber. She was standing at a table in the back of the room and waved at me. As I hurried over, she took my hands and leaned over to kiss my cheek. The scent of her perfume wafted over me, but I didn't recognize it. I hope you don't mind meeting here. I thought we could talk and listen to music at the same time. No, this is just great. Such a welcome change from my little office. We ordered cocktails and I asked her to tell me about her business. She pulled her chair closer to mine and tilted her head toward me, so as not to disturb the others. I breathed in the scent of her perfume again. It was haunting, but not too strong. The divorce she was seeking was very simple. We met in high school, dated exclusively in college, and married young. But gradually we drifted apart, with different tastes, opinions, and interests. Irreconcilable differences is how one might describe what happened to us. So we decided to do the civilized thing and get a friendly divorce. We basically agreed on the division of property. All I need now is for someone to be in my corner to make sure I don't miss anything and help me through the process. If only everyone took such a mature approach. Sure, I can do that. Thank you, she sighed into my ear. Now, if we're going to work together, I'd like to know a little bit about you. Well, as a person. I didn't usually get this kind of request from clients, but I didn't mind telling her a little about myself. We started exchanging bits and pieces of our stories. Stories about the who slash what slash when slash where and why of our lives. While we were doing this, the waitress brought another serving and appetizers, and two delightful things happened. First, Amber proved to be a good listener, pulling me through, showing genuine interest in what I was sharing. Second, when she started talking about herself, I was surprised to discover how much we had in common. We liked the same music, went to the same concerts, watched the same movies, and preferred the same cuisine. It was almost supernatural. As we began our third round of cocktails, I thought to myself, it was as if we were made for each other. Renee's face flashed through my mind, and I felt a pang of guilt. Then I remembered how strained our relationship had become, and how she'd practically dumped me this week. The guilt disappeared. I'm not doing anything wrong, just enjoying the company of a new acquaintance, I reasoned. We talked long enough for the fourth cocktail to appear and was emptied. As the group took a break, Amber leaned over to me and said, I need to run to the ladies' room. Please wait, I'll be right back. As she walked toward an alcove at the far end of the room, I couldn't take my eyes off the way her hips and legs moved in her tight skirt. Shit! When she returned, I realized I needed to relieve the pressure on my bladder and excused myself. Standing in front of the urinal, all I could think about was how beautiful and charming my new client was. Finished, I washed my hands and then carefully checked my appearance in the mirror. There was another portion waiting at our table. Before I could say anything, she smiled and said, I'll have to go after this one. I really didn't want the evening to end, so I settled down next to her and raised my glass, intending to drink as long as possible. The band returned, and as we sipped our cocktails, she leaned over to me and said hotly, I just love this number. Indeed, the little trio was improvising on the theme of a classic Miles Davis composition, one of my favorites. I smiled in appreciation and we sat, almost touching, enjoying the music. After a minute or two, she rested her head on my shoulder and her perfume wafted back to me. The applause from the other patrons startled me and I instinctively stood up as the lights came on in the hall. Amber was standing right in front of me, almost touching. She lifted herself up on tiptoe to reach my ear. I drove here in an Uber. Would you mind giving me a ride home? Sure, I replied without hesitation. I'd love to. Drive me, she said. As I pulled into the street, she leaned over and took my hand, pointing the way to her apartment. When I parked on the curb in front of her building, she threw me a meaningful look and sighed. If you'll come upstairs with me, I can give you a copy of the proposed property division agreement. All I could do was nod. The thought of being alone with her in her apartment pushed all rational thought out of my head. Once inside the apartment, she led me to a padded corner. Her cell phone pinged softly. She glanced at the message, 
typed a quick reply, and then smiled at me. Let me turn the sound off so we won't be disturbed. Placing the phone and purse on the coffee table, she gave me a smile so promising it took my breath away. Hold on a second, I'm going into the bedroom to freshen up. As she disappeared down the hallway, I looked around her apartment. Everything was perfectly arranged in its place. It looked like a furniture showroom. Suddenly, a sound from the wooden coffee table startled me, and I realized her cell phone was vibrating from another text message. I picked it up to put it on something quieter and was surprised when the screen lit up. It displayed the conversation that Amber had apparently been having with someone all evening. Had he arrived yet? Just got here. X in the drink? Done. Don't forget the video. Okay. My foggy brain had a hard time interpreting the cryptic messages, but then I noticed something that set off an alarm I couldn't ignore. There was no name attached to the messages, just a phone number I knew by heart. Renee. Why is Renee texting Amber? What the hell was going on? I couldn't put it all together, but I suddenly felt an overwhelming urge to get out of there. I quickly ripped a page out of the architectural digest lying on the coffee table and wrote a note in the margin. Sorry, have to leave. An alarm just came in from my office. Call me tomorrow. Robert. With those words, I rushed to the door and went outside as quietly as possible. Once back in the car, I pulled away from the curb and sped off at all possible speed. What does all this mean? How does Renee know Amber? How did she know we were going out tonight? What do these messages mean? With my mind blurred and panicked, I hadn't been paying attention to where I was going and was surprised to find that I had automatically made it to my office. Not knowing what else to do, I staggered to the door and allowed myself to go inside. I sat down on the couch that Maddie had found for us on Craigslist and put my head on my hands, trying to stop the spinning in the room. Eventually, I gave up and laid down to rest my eyes. Squire, wake up. Are you okay? What happened? I opened my eyes and saw Maddie's worried face looming over me. Oh, God, I moaned, sitting up awkwardly. What time is it? A little after seven. Oh, shit. Then I looked up at her. You wouldn't happen to have any aspirin, would you? She hurried to her purse and came back with two pills and a coffee cup. I popped the aspirin in my mouth, took a big sip of coffee, and shrieked. Oh, that's so hot. Good, she said, putting her hands on her hips. Maybe this will help you sober up. I shook my head, which made it hurt even more. I drank a lot last night, but I don't think that's all. I think I was drugged. She pulled her chair over to me and sat down with a concerned look on her face. What's wrong, squire? Tell me everything and we'll try to figure it out. I began to describe the night's events, omitting details such as the temptation I had felt. However, it must have caught Maddie's eye because she asked Riley, Is this how you usually conduct client meetings? I didn't bother to answer. She knew the answer. When I moved on to telling her about taking Amber to her apartment, the expression on Maddie's face changed to one that I couldn't identify. So you slept with her? She demanded. No, that's when things got really weird. I thought we were over the line. I ignored her. When Amber came back into the bedroom, her phone vibrated with a text message. I looked at it and it blew my mind. The message was from Renee. Maddie's eyes widened. Renee, how's your wife, Renee? Exactly. I recognized Renee's phone number. It freaked me out. How does Renee know Amber and why would she text her at this hour? What exactly was in the message? There was a whole series of messages, and I can't remember them all. But she was asking Amber about X in a video. Anyway, I got totally paranoid, wrote Amber a note about the break-in at the office, and got the hell out of there. That's the first smart thing I've done all night. Maddie is good at sarcasm. I ignored her again. When I got to the car, I had a hard time thinking. Maybe it was all those cocktails, but it felt like it was more than that. Anyway, I ended up here and collapsed on the couch. And I still don't understand what happened. Maddie was silent for a moment, then leaned forward. Squire, I think you were set up. My head was still throbbing. What do you mean, set up? Was it you who suggested we go to the jazz club to meet? No, it was Amber's idea. And you were the one who treated her to cocktails? Well, no, but I didn't mind. Nope. And you offered to drive her home? Well, she asked, but I was happy to do it. Besides, she said she had a copy of her husband's proposed agreement in her apartment. Right. So basically, what you're saying is that she decided where you'd go, how long you'd stay, how much you'd drink, when you'd leave, and that you'd eventually return to her apartment. Oh, God, I moaned, holding my forehead. And those texts you saw, Renee asking Amber where you've been? No, I don't think so. She just asked, is he there yet? What was the last message you saw? Don't forget the video. So what do you think made Amber wait so long in the bedroom? 
She said she wanted to freshen up, but I was hoping she had changed into something more comfortable. Maddie rolled her eyes. I bet she made sure the hidden camera was ready to record what happens next. Her head was already on the mend, but her mood was getting worse. Shit, 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 you're probably right. Suddenly it hit me. And I bet I know why. Renee was going to use Amber's little shoot to blackmail me. Now it was Maddie's turn to be embarrassed. But why would Renee want to blackmail you, Squire? I thought she was the one with all the money. Exactly, I said, and now the pieces were quickly coming together. She wants to divorce me on the grounds of adultery to avoid having to share the property with me. I shook my head in disgust. I knew things were bad between us, but I never thought she'd try something as despicable as this. But who is Amber and how does she fit into all this? Isn't it obvious? She's a decoy to lure me into a trap. She's probably an expensive escort hired by Renee. Then I paused. But if that's the case, she's certainly fooled me. She knew so much about me, and we had so much in common. At that moment, my phone rang, and I recognized the number. It's Amber, I mumbled to Maddie. Get her over here. If we can talk to her, we might get to the bottom of this. It amused me that Maddie wanted to play detective, but I wanted to know what was going on too, so I answered. Hi, Maddie. I'm sorry I disappeared last night. I thought my office had been broken into, but it turns out some drunk guy accidentally set off the alarm. Listen, I've been meaning to call you. Could you bring that property settlement over here sometime this morning? And then, I let my tone deepen. If you're not busy after work, we could get together and continue the wonderful evening we had. Maddie made a face at me, but Amber's voice sounded willing and even a little relieved. She promised to stop by my office before noon. You're not thinking of going out with her again, are you? Demanded Maddie when I hung up. I grinned. No, even I'm not that stupid. But if she's still trying to trap me, I wanted to encourage her that she can do it. Maddie nodded, and I noted the slight smile that flashed across her lips. Then she cut to the chase. Look, while we're waiting for her to show up, why don't we make some inquiries about Amber Thomas and see what we can find out? We sat down side by side at Maddie's computer. First thing first, I said. Let's check the court records to see if Amber Thomas filed for divorce. No surprise. There was nothing. Finding nothing else, Maddie did a quick Google search for Amber Thomas, Houston, Texas. A little over 40 queries came up, with occupations ranging from teacher to technician to homemaker, etc. This is going to be slow, I muttered. Then it hit me. Let's check the police records and see if we can find anything. If she really is a prostitute, she may have been busted for solicitation. The idea seemed like a good one, but we didn't find anything that could help us. Maddie shook her head. Amber Thomas is probably an assumed name. Then she suddenly perked up. What's the address of her apartment? Maybe that way we can figure something out. When I gave her the address, she quickly went through the tax lists. It took a while, but then she looked at me anxiously. Squire, if I understand correctly, the apartment you took her to was purchased by Baker, Norton, and Vincent five years ago. Now that's interesting. Let me try something else to be sure, she said, and did a quick search on that law firm. Going to their website, she found a list of employees. There were over a hundred names, but they were in alphabetical order. Again, hit and miss. No Amber Thomas. Maddie sank into her chair and was about to close the window when she suddenly stopped. Wait a minute, look at this. Her cursor highlighted Amber Tompkins in accounting. When she clicked on the name, a picture of Amber Thomas appeared. Holy shit, Squire, she works at your wife's firm. I shook my head in confusion. They may work at the same law firm, Maddie, but Amber handles the back office. She has nothing to do with Renee. Well, at least we know where Renee hired her. Maybe we can fill in the blanks when Amber gets here. We tried to get some work done, but it was hard to concentrate. At 11 o'clock, we heard a car pull up to the house. Then Amber burst into my office, looking as gorgeous as I remembered her. But before she could say anything, Maddie walked in behind Amber, and I gestured to her. I don't think you've met my legal assistant, Madison Armstrong. Amber looked taken aback for a moment, but then held out her hand with a wide smile. Nice to meet you, Miss Armstrong. I'm Amber Thomas. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Amber Tompkins, Maddie replied without a matching smile. Amber turned pale and gasped slightly. Then she stopped herself. I think you misheard. It's Amber Thomas. Maddie glared at her. I meant exactly what I said, Amber Tompkins. Amber looked around nervously for help, but saw me standing there with my arms folded and a stern expression on my face. We know who you are, Amber. Now I think it's time to tell us what's going on. Amber shifted her gaze from me to Maddie and back again with a shocked expression on her face. Then, to our amazement, she burst into tears and slumped into a chair. I never wanted to do this. I told Renee it was a stupid idea, but she wouldn't listen. She cried some more, 
then pulled a handkerchief out of her purse and wiped her eyes. Okay, I'll tell you the whole story. Renee set the whole thing up. She, uh, cut you off at home so you'd be, uh, more receptive to me. She instructed me on what to say to you, your likes and dislikes, anything to make you more comfortable with me. And just in case that wasn't enough, she gave me some ecstasy to slip into your drink. When I went to the bathroom, I said bitterly, that's right. Then I asked you to drive me back to the firm's guest apartment. I looked at Maddie. That explains why it looks so sterile and uninhabitable. I stared at Amber. There wasn't a single personal item in the room. She nodded grudgingly. And when you went back to the bedroom, what did you do? I put on my nightgown. She blushed. Renee told me what kind of underwear you like. I bet that's not all you were doing, Maddie interjected. Now Amber couldn't look at us. I also turned on the camera Renee gave me and made sure it was pointed at the bed. Maddie snorted angrily, but I had other questions. Why, Amber? Why did you and Renee try to set me up like that? Now she was looking at me with pleading eyes. She didn't want to talk about it, but I think the answer is pretty obvious. She wants out of your marriage so she can date Hoffmeister. A lot of people know they're having an affair. Vance Hoffmeister? He's her boss. The firm would never tolerate them having a relationship. She shook her head. Upper management doesn't know. And when they're both divorced, the firm won't be able to say anything. All they'll do is assign her a new boss. I turned to Maddie. We were right. This was a preemptive strike. Get undeniable proof of my infidelity, and then get a quick and painless divorce without paying me practically anything. Word is that Renee is about to make partner, Amber added. If she gets it, she'll start getting really big money. She probably doesn't want you to get any of that money. I stared at her. But why you, Amber? How did you get involved in this dirty scam? I don't see how you can win. She began to cry again, quietly but bitterly. It's my own stupid fault. When my marriage broke up a couple years ago, I accumulated large debts. I was gradually paying them off when my sister got sick and needed money for an operation. She had no assets and I had no credit. She didn't look at us. But I had access to an escrow account I had set up for one of the firm's clients. I was desperate, so I withdrew $48,000 to help my sister. I know it was wrong, but what else could I do? Now she looked at me defiantly. No one noticed anything, and I started gradually paying the money back. I had just finished paying it all back when Renee came to me. She knew about everything I'd done and demanded my help in exchange for my silence. Her defiance evaporated. She needed help with you. I glanced at Maddie. The anger on her face was gone, replaced by compassion. I felt a little sorry for the woman. So what do we do now, Squire? I don't know, Maddie. I wish I could somehow turn the situation with Renee and her boss around, but I have no idea how to do that. Suddenly, Amber brightened. I think I know a way. We both stared at her in surprise. You know they've been negotiating at Alessandra's all this week? Now I know the room we booked for Renee, and there's gossip that they're practically living together. If we could sneak this webcam into her room, maybe you could get exactly what you need. I brightened momentarily, and then reality came over me. That would be great, I said, but we don't have James Bond working for us. How would one of us be able to sneak into a luxury hotel, break into a locked room, set up a camera, and sneak out unnoticed? Maddie stared at me. I can do it. How? I asked doubtfully. Disguise yourself as a maid. They have access to all the rooms. And how are you going to do that? She smiled slightly. My mom works as a maid at the Alessandra. I stared at her. I didn't know. Then the image of Maddie dressed as a maid appeared in front of me, and I instinctively recoiled. No, Maddie, you can't do that. You're a law student. It wouldn't look... I blanched, not knowing what to say. Besides, it would be too risky. What if Renee stops by to see you? I'm supposed to be there with the team this afternoon to support them. I can call you and let you know when the meeting is over. Maddie folded her arms, a look of determination on her face. Then it settled. She looked at me intently. I can handle it, Squire. The three of us worked on the details of our plan some more and then set about implementing it. Maddie went outside to call her mother. After a long conversation that I would have loved to overhear, she came back and nodded. She's going to help me. It's all set. The three of us got in my car and drove to the BNV-owned apartment Amber was using. She went inside and soon returned with a camera that looked surprisingly tiny to me. Are you sure this is going to work? I asked doubtfully. You'd be surprised how well, she replied. And we'll be able to connect to it over the internet? Sure, through the Wi-Fi at the hotel. From there, we drove downtown to Dallas Street and pulled into the garage next door to Alessandra's. Hopefully, we can get my laptop connected to the internet, I thought, 
as I climbed up onto the roof. As it turned out, there was no need to worry. The hotel's Wi-Fi signal was so strong that it penetrated beyond the building. We easily connected to the network using the password Amber had given us. Then I entered the webcam URL and we were all set. While I set up the camera, Amber hurriedly left to meet with the BNV support staff and Maddie left to go to her mother's house. I was left sitting in the hot car with my cell phone at the ready, pondering what could go wrong with our fancy plan. When the phone rang an hour later, it brought me out of my heat-induced stupor. Robert, it's Amber. The meeting is about to break. Is the webcam in place? I haven't heard from Maddie. I'll call her right now. I hung up and dialed Maddie's number. The maid just went up to Renee's floor, she told me. I'll slip into her room in a moment. Hurry up, I asked. They're probably on their way there by now. My phone ran out of battery, and for the next few minutes, I anxiously alternated between checking my phone and my laptop. My phone beeped first. A message from Maddie. Almost done, it read. I updated my laptop's connection to the web address Amber had given us, and suddenly I saw Maddie's face staring back at me. I almost didn't recognize her. She was wearing a shapeless gray dress, and her hair was swept back and covered by a large gray scarf. Maddie, hurry up, hissed I, and she almost fell on her back. You scared me, she accused, and then went back to adjusting the camera position. At that moment, I heard the sound of a key opening the door lock, and my wife walked into the room. Oh my God, she's met Maddie before. She would surely recognize her. Holding her breath, Renee looked at Maddie and then looked around. What are you doing here? She asked. Maddie curtsied. Refuse service, ma'am. She calmly walked over to the double bed and pulled the covers off one of the pillows. Would you like one mint or two? She asked. No mints, Renee snarled, turning away from her. Just finish it and leave. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to bother you, ma'am. With those words, Maddie turned, winked at the camera, and then nonchalantly left the room. Luckily, I remembered to turn off the speaker on my laptop because I let out a huge sigh of relief. She didn't recognize Maddie. Apparently, Renee hadn't bothered to pay attention to the help. At that moment, the passenger door jerked open, scaring me half to death until I saw Amber sliding into the car. Did Maddie make it in time? She asked. I gestured to the laptop and tapped the screen. Renee's room reappeared, but it was empty. Then I noticed the bathroom door was closed. Surely Renee is in there, I said. We heard a jaunty knock on the hotel room door, and Renee hurried out of the bathroom wearing the complimentary robe Alessandra had provided. When she opened the door, a man entered the room. It's Hoffmeister, Amber whispered. Thank God you're finally here, Renee said. I thought these old dinosaurs would never end. I knew what was about to happen, but it still didn't prepare me for reality. Renee, the woman I had loved unconditionally throughout most of our marriage, was about to cheat on me with another man before my eyes. I must have made some kind of noise because Amber reached across the console and patted my arm. I'm so sorry, she whispered. Suddenly, the back door of my car swung open, startling us both. Maddie climbed inside. I got here as fast as I could, she said, panting. Did I miss anything? I silently pointed to the laptop, and she leaned back in her seat to get a good look at it. Oh, she said and went silent. Maddie sighed, and I could see the anger on Amber's face. Renee pulled herself up on the bed. I talked to Amber at recess today, she reassured him. She said she's going to see Robert again tonight, and she promised she'll get everything out of him this time. I hope so. You don't think she's getting cold feet, do you? She has no choice. We lured her into embezzlement, and she knows it. He nodded. And when we get the videotape, you'll nail him, too. She smirked. If he tries to resist, I'll threaten him with going before the bar with a misconduct charge for sleeping with a client. Vance looked at her incredulously. I don't know if you can pull that off, babe. Didn't the Texas Bar Association dismiss that charge? Who cares? She grinned. The last thing a practicing single attorney needs is a reputation for screwing over his clients. He'd have to leave town if that got out. Anyway, the judges here aren't too favorable to adulterers, so once I file suit, I should be able to get a quick judgment and be free of him in a couple of months. Then her expression changed. What about you? How soon can you leave your sanctimonious wife? We've already talked about this, Renee. I can't do anything until Baker is gone. But I have word that the old fart has told the senior partners he'll retire after Christmas. All I have to do is wait until the new year. Then I can apply too. He saw the hurt expression on her face and hurried to reassure her. The timing will be perfect, baby. Your marriage will be ancient history by then. And when I file, we'll be free to see each other in public. We'll have an affair and be married in no time, you'll see. Okay, she sighed. But it's so hard to hide. 
A devilish smile flashed across her lips. Speaking of hard, I reached over and turned off the web feed. I think we have everything we need, and I know that's about all I can handle. My companions looked at me sympathetically, and for a few moments we sat in silence. Then Maddie reached out to squeeze my shoulder again. Squire, I have to go. I have to give my mom back the key to the upper room in this uniform, and she wants me to stay and have dinner with her tonight. She says I'm ignoring her. Of course, Maddie, I understand. Look, I can't thank you enough for what you did tonight. You took a huge risk, and I shouldn't have let you do that. But if you hadn't, we wouldn't have the video. You know I'm willing to do anything, Squire. She seemed a little out of breath. Anyway, I gotta run. With those words, she climbed out of the back seat and hurried to the elevator in the parking lot. I turned to Amber. The same goes for you. If you hadn't helped us, I'd still be in the dark about Renee's plans. She smiled bitterly and patted my arm. After what I tried to do to you, it was the least I could do. Yeah, but that was because you were being blackmailed. Maybe so, but either way, you gave me a chance to make things right. I'm very grateful to you for that. Then she sat up a little straighter. So what happens next? I thought about it. I want to edit this video and make a copy. Once I do that, I'll need to figure out how to get Baker to watch it. I think I can help you with that too. There's a banquet at the hotel tonight to celebrate the conclusion of the negotiations. Renee and Vance will be there, of course, and they think I'll be, ahem, sealing the deal with you. And there's a morning meeting here tomorrow to wrap up loose ends, and Baker is going to attend. She smiled slightly. He's always the last one to speak. Anyway, you'll be able to catch him before he gets back to the office. That's perfect, I told her. I want to strike while the iron is hot. I'll have to work late, but it'll be worth it. She pouted sweetly and looked at me, drooping her eyelids. That's too bad, Robert. You really are a very impressive guy. I was hoping to spend some off-camera time with you. Now it was up to me to blush. I can't tell you how tempting it is, Amber, but I have to decline, at least for one more night. B.I. really needs to get everything ready for tomorrow. She pouted her lips. My loss. Anyway, I'll call you tomorrow so you know when to come back to the hotel. Then she turned to get out of the car. Amber, I interrupted her. I really appreciate everything you've done for me. I want you to know that I'm going to take care of you, okay? She gave me another of her megawatt smiles. I'd like to take care of you too, Robert. I can't believe you said no. I cursed myself as I watched her walk towards the elevator. After she left, I stopped at a small restaurant I liked and grabbed some food before heading to my office. Another evening of eating at my desk while working. My first task was to edit the video we had just shot. Nothing drastic. It took a while, but when I was satisfied, I made a copy I could give to Baker. After that, I pulled out my law books and did a little contract review. I had given a lot of thought to what I wanted out of my failed marriage, and the last thing I wanted to do was mess it up with a legal mistake. I worked on the contract for several hours. When it was finished, I printed out a few copies and put them in a legal size envelope. Then I got up and went out to our clunky old office couch to put my feet up and rest. Now that I had finished everything that needed to be done that evening, I had some time to think about my situation. As I edited the video, I couldn't help but think about Renee and our marriage. I loved her so much, and I felt like she loved me just as much. Why did all of that change? Looking back, I realized that I had become a disappointment to her. She wanted a husband with a prestigious title who would make a lot of money. I guess that's what I wanted too. But when things didn't work out at Alita, I still wanted to practice law. I looked around my scraggly little office. Even if it wasn't glamorous or particularly lucrative, it was mine, and I was doing what I wanted to do. Why couldn't Renee be happy for me? But even if I disappointed her, even if she wanted to end our marriage, that didn't justify her trying to screw me over like that. It hurt me to know that she had found another lover. It hurt me to know that she had deceived me for so long. But it wasn't enough for her to just divorce me and walk away. She had to try to set things up so that I would lose everything. Her infidelity was bad enough. Her perfidy was unforgivable. And because of her perfidy, my life was going to change drastically. Whether or not I succeeded in my little coup tomorrow, my life could never be the same again. I'd burn bridges behind me practicing law. Heck, I'd burn bridges behind me working in Houston. Thank you so much, Renee. I laid on my back, closed my eyes, and tried not to think about what was happening to my life. I must have fallen asleep because the next thing I knew, Maddie was already shaking me to wake me up. Squire, Squire, is everything okay? Hi, Maddie. Yeah, everything's fine. I was just working late on our plan and I must have fallen asleep. I sat up and looked at her curiously. What are you even doing here? It's Saturday. You're not supposed to be at work. Her face lowered, and for a moment I thought she was about to cry. I know, Squire. 
I just wanted to come say goodbye to you in person. I jumped to my feet. Say goodbye? What are you talking about? I have to go back to school. Monday is the first day of school. No, that can't be. She shook her head sorrowfully. I'm afraid it is. But, but you can't go, Maddie. What will I do without you here? Tears were streaming down her cheeks now. I thought I'd be glad to go back to school. But the thing is, Squire, this has been the best summer of my life. I've learned so much from you, experienced so much. A slight smile appeared on her lips. My classmates are going to be so jealous when they hear about my summer internship. I stood up, stunned at the thought of her leaving. In my hind mind, I knew she would be going back to school, of course. But so much had happened, and we had become such a good team that I had completely forgotten. Maddie, I don't know what to say. If it helps, I'll write you the best recommendation an intern has ever gotten. I'll do anything for you. I just wish you didn't have to leave. She rushed over to me and hugged me tightly. I'll never forget you, Squire. She kissed my cheek, then turned and rushed to the door before I could say a word. I could hear her crying, and frankly, I felt like crying too. At that moment, my cell phone rang, and looking at the display, I saw it was Amber. I hope you're ready, she said in a quiet voice, as if there were strangers nearby. The meeting will adjourn in the next half hour, so you'd better get here as soon as possible. Thanks, Amber, I said grimly. I'll be right there. When I stepped out of the hotel elevator on the 21st floor, Amber rushed out to greet me. She was out of breath. You just made it. She pointed to the double doors behind her. He should be out of there any minute. Thanks, Amber. Now you need to work on yourself. Good luck, she whispered, and kissed my cheek before hiding. When I looked back, I saw the doors to the conference room open, and Roger Baker walked in, accompanied by several assistants to whom he was giving orders. That was it. I walked over and blocked his path. Hello, Mr. Baker. He looked up startled, and his aides fidgeted uncertainly. Then his face lit up with recognition. I know you. You're Renee Wilson's husband, aren't you? I nodded. You have a good memory for faces. He smiled weakly. What can I do for you, young man? Actually, I just wanted to warn you that on Monday I'm going to file a lawsuit against your firm that will ruin its reputation for years to come. The young men huddled around him gave a friendly sigh, but Baker's face only contorted into a grin. Really, Mr. Wilson? On what grounds can you sue us? Let's start with conspiracy to defraud, malpractice, misuse of client funds, embezzlement, extortion, blackmail, violation of the Texas Bar Association Code of Conduct, shall I go on? To the murmurs of his men, Baker shook his head dismissively. Talk is cheap, young man. If you want to make a fool of yourself, I'll see you in court. I'm losing it. Don't you even want to see proof of my accusations? I held out a thumb drive with a copy of our video. Do you know what this is? His vanity took over. I'm not as computer illiterate as you think. I know what a flash drive is. Then if any of your people have a laptop with them, you can look at what I have and make your own judgment. He waved his hand, and an assistant quickly handed him the laptop. He held out his hand to me for the disc. Well? I looked around at his surroundings. With all due respect to your colleagues, I think you'll want to review this in private. He looked at me coldly, then made a decision. Find me a spare room, he ordered to no one in particular, and the group scattered like cockroaches caught in the light. After a minute or two, one of them opened the door and called out to his boss. The white-haired lawyer strode imperiously in the direction indicated, and I hurried to follow. If this is some kind of joke, sir, would you like to... But I had already inserted the disc and clicked the icon. As the image filled the screen and began to play, his threat was cut off halfway through. I think you recognize my wife, Renee Wilson, though I hope you haven't seen her like this before. He said nothing but didn't take his eyes off the screen. This man is, of course, one of your junior partners, Vance Hoffmeister. As you can see, he and my wife are on fairly close terms. Baker still said nothing. I think I should point out a couple of things about Mr. Hoffmeister. The first is that he is Renee's supervisor at your firm, which is a clear violation of the BNV Code of Conduct. The second is that, if I understand correctly, Mr. Hoffmeister is also the husband of your niece. The old man couldn't hide his disgust. That rogue bastard. Mr. Baker, unless you wish otherwise, I'll spare you the next half hour of events on this video. He shook his head. Then let's get to what you need to see. But first let me point out that two of your attorneys are entertaining themselves in a room your firm has booked at this very hotel. I reached over to restart the video. I saw Baker frown, then suddenly look up at me. What was that about embezzlement? I stopped the playback. I regret to inform you that Amber Tompkins, an employee in your administrative department, managed to embezzle almost $50,000 from an escrow account managed by your firm. 
These two found out about it and blackmailed her in an attempt to seduce me. Watching Baker's face, I couldn't figure out which disgusted him more, the blackmail or the embezzlement. I reached for the keyboard again. There's another snippet I think you might want to watch. On the screen, my wife was looking at her lover. What about you? How soon can you get rid of your little prude? We've talked about this before, Renee. I can't do anything until Baker is gone. But I know the old fart told the senior partners he'll retire after Christmas. All I have to do is wait until the new year. Then I can apply too. The timing will be perfect, baby. Your marriage will be ancient history by then. And once I apply, we'll be free to see each other in public. We'll have a torrid affair and we'll be married in no time, you'll see. Okay, she sighed, but it's so hard to wait. A devilish smile flashed across her lips. And speaking of hard, I stopped the video. You have a pretty good pair of employees, sir. And what I find particularly intriguing about the last segment is that I understand your niece is pregnant. It looks like your sister's grandson will be growing up without the presence of a father. Staring at the screen, he became visibly angry. After a minute or two, he regained his composure and turned to me. You know this video is not admissible in court. I smiled at him. That's for the judge to decide, isn't it? But he'll see it, and others will see it, and the rumor will spread just the same. If anything, we live in an age where privacy has been destroyed. You do realize it's only a matter of time before this hits the internet. I sighed with feigned sympathy. Just think how it will affect your firm's reputation if its lawyers conspire to blackmail. Think how your clients will feel knowing that the administrator can loot their escrow accounts at will. Think about how your niece will feel, especially in the last trimester of her pregnancy. He leaned back on the table and folded his arms across his chest. How much do you want? Sir? How much do you want this to end? I opened the envelope I was holding, pulled out two copies of the contract I had prepared, and held it out to him. I think you'll find this covers everything. He shook his head sourly and began to read. Five million dollars. If you keep reading, you'll see it's five million minus taxes. That's outrageous. I don't think so. Obviously, after this is over, I will no longer be able to practice law in Houston. You're just covering the present value of the potential earnings I'll have to give up. Besides, from what I hear, that amount isn't that far off from what a senior partner in your firm makes in a year. He hummed, but continued reading. After a moment, he looked up with a puzzled expression on his face. You don't want your money within three months? I want to make damn sure they don't become part of the divorce settlement. He didn't say anything, but I thought a smile flashed across his face. The next paragraph caught his attention. Amnesty for Tompkins? Why do you want to protect her? She only took those funds because her sister required surgery. What's more, she replaced them completely before Renee and Vance discovered her embezzlement. I think she deserves some compassion. He sighed, shook his head, and continued reading. Finally, he looked up at me again. You know I can't sign anything right now. I need to have another lawyer check it out. I laughed in his face. The most famous lawyer in Houston, the head of Baker, Norton, and Vinson, can't review a simple contract? Look, you either sign now or I'm taking this video to the Houston Chronicle editorial board. That's blackmail, young man. No, sir, it's negotiation. He glared at me, then reached for a pen. If you violate this non-disclosure agreement, there will be hell to pay, he snarled. Keeping silent about all of this is in my best interest, sir. He shook his head in disgust, then signed and dated both copies. When he was done, he handed me my copy. To my surprise, he nodded. You know, I'd do exactly the same thing if I were you. I didn't expect that. Then a sly expression appeared on his face. I think it's time for me to have a little chat with Renee and Vance. Do you want to stay and watch? I think you've earned it. I'd like that very much, I replied grimly. He walked to the door and swung it open, startling the people crowded outside. I want to see Hoffmeister and Wilson here now. The small crowd scattered again. A few minutes later, there was a knock on the door, and Renee and Vance entered. You wanted to see us, Mr. Baker? Renee asked. Asked Renee. And then she noticed me. Robert, what are you doing here? Baker intervened. Miss Wilson, I've been watching you during the negotiations this week, and I must say you've done a good job for us. She glowed at the compliment. Well, thank you, sir. I... But he didn't finish. So you can appreciate my disappointment at having to fire you for cause. What? She gasped. Why? Baker gestured at me. Your husband has told me some interesting things about your marriage. I saw her hesitate. Sir, everything he's told you is a lie. Robert and I are in the process of divorcing. He'll say anything to make me look bad. Baker smiled slyly. I'm not relying on his words, Miss Wilson, but on your own. With those words, he unfolded the laptop and clicked on an icon. 
When an image of the two lovers appeared on the screen, both Renee and Vance gasped. How the hell? Vance reprimanded, and Renee reached up to close the laptop. But Baker's gesture stopped him. Let's watch and listen some more, okay? While the guilty couple watched in horror, Baker let my edited version play in its entirety, including a discussion of their extortion scheme. Baker slammed the laptop shut. I told you you were a good lawyer, Miss Wilson. Would you care to tell me how many laws, rules, codes, and ethics you admitted to violating in that video? But Mr. Baker? That's enough, he snarled. Then he walked over and opened the door. Mr. Rosen, he called, gesturing to one of his assistants. Escort Miss Wilson into the office and stay with her while she clears her desk. She's only allowed to remove her personal belongings. No folders, no electronic equipment, no papers. Inspect everything and then escort her out of the building. Do you understand? The man flinched. Yes, sir. Renee managed to throw a shocked glance over her shoulder at Vance before she disappeared from sight. All the while, Hoffmeister had retreated to a corner of the room, trying to be as inconspicuous as possible. It wasn't enough, and Baker turned his attention to the cowardly man. Under other circumstances, Hoffmeister, you would be out the door with your lover by now. But I love my sister and her daughter, and I'm not about to give up the father of her future child, no matter how much of a piece of shit you are. However, I am immediately stripping you of your partner status. Instead, I am appointing you as my personal assistant on special assignments. I will send you to a place where you will have less chance of being seduced by the next whore that comes into your sight. Now get out of my sight and go home to your wife. And Vance, treat her like a queen, understand? Yes, sir, he squeaked and sprinted out of the room. Baker sank into a chair and turned to me. Well, Mr. Wilson, are you satisfied? Yes, sir, satisfied, I told him. Good. Then get out of here. I need to call my partners and resign. Apparently, this place has dogs and I need to clean up their shit. He tilted his head and gave me an assessing look. You know, I may have hired the wrong Wilson. Then his face hardened and he stared at me angrily. But I'd still rather never see your face again. I grinned and headed for the door. Likewise, I'm sure. And she left, clutching the copy of the contract tightly in her hand. Two days later, on Monday, after that major altercation at Alessandra's, I filed for divorce on grounds of adultery. Baker surprised me by arranging a quick hearing before a sympathetic judge. I guess he didn't want to drag out the case and risk things becoming public. Renee didn't contest the divorce. She had seen the video of me filming Vance and her. She didn't want it shown in court. Of course, I was bound by a non-disclosure agreement, but she didn't know about my deal with Baker. I didn't bother to educate her. Early on after the lawsuit was filed, she called me and asked if there was any way I could forgive her. Even if I could get over your cheating, I could never forgive your betrayal, I told her. She didn't try to argue again. Perhaps it helped that I offered her a straightforward property settlement. You take yours, I take mine, anything jointly owned we split. I could have tried to punish her, but I didn't want her to fight me and learn that I couldn't use the video against her. She decided to accept my deal and end the loss. Good riddance. We put our house on the market and tried to sell it quickly. It did. And although we didn't make any money on the sale, at least we had it on our hands. Another task accomplished. Another bond between us broken. While I waited for the divorce to become final, I spent my time winding down my law practice. Some clients I handled in the time I had left. Others I passed on to another attorney I knew who was trying to make it on his own. While all this was going on, I spent a lot of time thinking about my life and my future. There was no realistic chance that I would be able to practice law in Houston again. Having such a powerful enemy as Roger Baker made me anathema to every other firm in town. Trying to revive my own law practice was also unsuccessful. Getting back into the oil industry was no good either. As I told Renee, the business had evolved, my experience was outdated, and my contacts had moved on. The good news was that, thanks to the settlement with Baker, I wouldn't have to worry about work for the foreseeable future. So I decided to get away from hot and humid Houston and spend a long vacation on a beach cooled by the ocean breeze. After a little research, I chose the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Why not lounge on the beach, pondering at leisure about my future? These plans should have made me happy, but instead I found myself depressed. In fact, as soon as I thought about it, I felt bad since the big showdown with Baker. Most people would like to be in your shoes. So why the hell don't you? Part of the problem, as I knew it, was that my marriage was over. I didn't miss Renee. She had very effectively destroyed any feelings I had once had for her. But I always saw myself with my wife and family and I couldn't help but mourn the loss of that way of life. And that wasn't all I lost. After working my butt off to graduate from law school and then starting my own firm, 
It was painful to forget about practicing law. In addition, I was about to leave the city where I had spent the last decade of my life, and there was a good chance I would never return. I had good reason to feel depressed about all these major life changes. But I knew that it wasn't over yet. Something else was still missing. I looked at the pictures of Costa Rica again. It's so beautiful there, so many things to see. I just wish I had someone to share it with. And then it hit me. It's not just Costa Rica. I don't want to start my new life alone. I want to share it with someone special. The moment I realized this, I knew exactly who I wanted. And I immediately squirmed in my seat. What if she doesn't need me? Why would she drop everything and come away with me? What would I do if she turned me down? I sat there arguing with myself, one minute trying to work up the courage to ask, the next trying to talk myself out of it. I had taken risks in my life before. I could do it again. Yes, like changing careers mid-career. That was a big risk and it didn't pay off, did it? But it failed for reasons beyond my control. That may be true, but it still didn't work out. What about opening your own law practice? That was another big risk, and it didn't pay off either. That's true. I knew the odds were against me, but I was too stubborn to admit it. In this case, it was all on my conscience. But not all of my ventures were failures. When I came across Renee's little scheme to set me up for treason, I decided to replay it. It paid off big time. Yeah, but I got damn lucky. Who says luck can't be good sometimes? Confronting Baker took guts, but I went for it and hit the jackpot. So why not roll the dice again, especially for something so important? I made my decision and went to my car. Two days later, I waited outside the ticketing area at Houston Hobby, standing on the terrazzo left over from the old airport. As I looked around anxiously, a woman's voice called out, Robert, is that you? I turned and saw Mary Margaret Olson hurrying toward me down the hallway as fast as her tight skirt would allow. I'm so glad I met you, she sighed as she walked up to me and took my hand. She looked at my bag. Are you going to leave town? I nodded. Yeah, I've already finished everything here and I'm going on an extended vacation. Good for you. Everyone needs to get away once in a while. I wouldn't mind doing it myself. I wasn't sure if she was implying that, so I stayed silent. I was sorry to hear about you and Renee, she continued. There wasn't an ounce of sadness in her face. Don't be. It was all for the best, I assure you. I understand, she nodded. She looked away for a moment. You know, she told me she's cheating on you. Really? I thought for a moment. Was that before or after you and I had lunch together? Now she was embarrassed. Before. Why didn't you warn me? She shrugged helplessly. I couldn't have done that. She's my best friend. I thought I was your friend too. She hesitated at my tone, then continued. I talked to her a couple weeks ago. I couldn't help myself. And how is she feeling? Not great. No law firm in town wants to hire her, so she decided to move back home to McAllen and practice on her own. I remained silent. The look on Mary Margaret's face said she understood the irony perfectly well. But I was still thinking about our little encounter over the summer. Tell me, Mary Margaret, why did you want to have lunch with me? Her smile became token. I've always liked you, Robert. I figured if things didn't work out with you and Renee, I'd throw my hat into the fray early. She looked at my bag. You know, I might change my travel plans if you wanted to keep me company. I looked at her coldly. Sorry, I've already asked someone who cares more about my well-being. She flinched but before she could say anything, I looked up. Actually, she's on her way. Mary Margaret looked where I was pointing and her eyes widened. Oh, she was running down the hall. When she spotted me, she dropped her bag and rushed out. A moment later, she hugged me so tightly it became hard to breathe. Squire, she squeaked happily. Then she kissed me and I was out of breath. As I hugged her, I had one thought running through my head. Thank God I went for it. Two days earlier, when I finally decided to venture out, I grabbed my car keys and drove to the University of Houston. It had been a few years, but I still remembered the road. But even as I drove northwest on the I-45 freeway, I still struggled with my insecurities. What made you think she was even interested in you? She hasn't said anything or tried to contact you since she went back to law school. Besides, she probably has a boyfriend. Even if she doesn't, you're almost 10 years older. Why would she want you? Despite my anxiety, I pulled off the highway onto Elgin drove under the Alvin Freeway, and found a parking spot next to the law center. Then I nervously walked into the main entrance and asked the first female student I saw if she knew Madison Armstrong. Everyone knows Maddie, she told me. Right now, she's probably in her legal writing class. After that, she usually goes to Commons. If you wait for her there, you'll probably see her. I found Commons and sat in a chair, watching the young future lawyers who were chatting, checking their phones, or 
ordering noodles from the little subway in one corner of the room. As I sat there, I gradually realized that I was attracting furtive glances, and I became a little paranoid. What's going on? Do I look like a stalker or something? Maybe my fly is unzipped? As I was getting more and more uncomfortable, a young woman approached me abruptly. Are you a squire? She asked. Uh, no, I mean yes, I mean... She crossed her arms and stared at me, then turned on her heel and walked away before I could say anything else. What the hell was that? The room had begun to fill with students, and many of them were now lined up along the walls. They seemed to be watching me, and I seriously considered making my way to the exit. Suddenly, there was a commotion in the crowd as the people at the back of the room stepped aside. Then Maddie came into the room and hesitantly approached me. She looked awful. Her hair was disheveled, there were bags under her eyes, and her clothes seemed to be hanging off her. When I stood up and took a step in her direction, she recoiled back, almost in fear. I didn't feel like having a conversation in front of an audience, but I didn't seem to have a choice. No sooner had I spoken, however, than she asked, What are you doing here, squire? In a voice so low I could barely hear her. Maddie, Renee and I are divorced now. We sold our house and I'm planning on leaving town. But I'd like to see you before I leave. The students watching us gave a friendly sigh, and then an angry rumble filled the room. Tears streamed down Maddie's face. I'm doing this all wrong, I thought. You don't understand, Maddie. I saw Baker and negotiated a settlement with him. I can't talk about it, but I closed my law firm. She wrapped her arms around herself, protecting herself from what was about to happen. Why didn't I think through what I wanted to say? I scolded myself. I know I'm doing it wrong, but I'm wondering if you could come with me. What? She asked in a thin voice. I shook my head in frustration. I know it's crazy, but I'm trying to ask if we could go away together, you and I? I shrugged helplessly. I've been so miserable since you left, and I just thought that maybe... She whispered something I couldn't understand. I looked at her uncertainly. What did you say? Yes, squire. I said yes, she said loudly, and then found herself in my arms, kissing me, and I heard a roar in my ears. She pulled away to look up at me. I thought I'd never see you again, and it was killing me. The roar was still audible, and it was hard to hear her. I looked around and realized all the students were cheering and clapping. Two days later, I was afraid you changed your mind, I said as I hugged her at the airport. Are you kidding me? I've been absolutely miserable since I went back to law school. My grades went to hell. I lost weight. Everyone in my class knew what was wrong with me. She looked up at me with shining eyes. When someone told me you were waiting for me in the commons, I thought I was dreaming. But I didn't know if it was a good dream or a nightmare. When you asked me to come with you, I realized that my good dream had come true. I was miserable too, Maddie, and I couldn't understand why. At first, I thought it was because of the divorce and all the crap that came with it. But eventually, I realized how much I missed having you in my life. Well, it's about time, she muttered with mocking seriousness before kissing me again. Mary Margaret had been watching us with a dejected expression on her face, and now she cleared her throat to get my attention. Looks like I'm the third wheel here. Good luck, Robert, she said hoarsely and hurried away. Maddie stepped back a little to watch her go, then looked at me with side vision. Who was that? I grinned. Don't you remember? It was Mary Margaret Olson, Renee's best friend. She came to lunch with me over the summer. Oh yes, I remember her now. Miss Hungry Eyes? She looked at me suspiciously. What was she doing here? Don't be jealous. She just happened to bump into me. And don't worry, I've made it clear I'm not interested in her. Maddie grabbed my hand and pulled me tightly to her. Good, and don't forget it. But before she left, she told me some interesting news about my ex-wife. After she was fired from Baker Norton, no law firm in town wanted to hire her. So Mary Margaret said Renee was going back to her hometown to put up her sign and practice on her own. Maddie laughed. Wow, that's karma. Well, it'll serve her right after what she tried to do to you. Suddenly, she let go of my hand and recoiled in alarm. My bag, I left my bag there. I laughed, watching her run gracefully after her down the hallway. Definitely an athlete, I thought happily. Then, hand in hand, we headed for the exit. As we approached the front desk, I reached into my pocket to hand her Maddie's ticket. That reminded me. I have a couple more things for you, I told her and held out the check. What's this? She asked. This is your paycheck for this summer. She looked at the check, then at me in confusion. Squire, you don't owe me anything for this summer. I agreed to work for free. I couldn't afford to pay you last summer, but I sure can now, so it would be wrong not to. I then handed her a second check, and her eyes widened when she saw the amount. I don't understand. What's this for? You told me you were going to take out student loans to work for me. Now this should be enough to pay off your law school debt. She stared at me in confusion, 
Then her voice became angry. Wait a minute, are you trying to buy me? I didn't agree to go with you because I need the money. I led her over to a couple of empty seats and sat down next to her. You took a leave of absence from law school to come with me. The least I can do is make it up to you so you're not burdened with a bunch of student loans. She started to protest, but I put my fingers to her lips. Look, Maddie, all I want is for us to be happy together, for us to enjoy each other without any worries. I'm not trying to buy you, Maddie. I'm just trying to buy some peace of mind for both of us, that's all. But where did all that money come from? Remember I told you I made a deal with Old Man Baker the day you came to say goodbye? Well, it was a very good arrangement. How good? I lowered my voice. Between you and me, I got $5 million tax-free in exchange for not suing and publicly embarrassing the firm. Her mouth dropped open. You can't tell anyone anything because I signed a non-disclosure agreement. But I can definitely afford to give you those checks. And we can enjoy each other for a long time without worrying about money. She stared at me for another moment. Then her frown disappeared and she hugged me again. That's all I want too, Squire. To be with you. She looked a little embarrassed. Actually, I've wanted that for a long time. You know, I think I started falling in love with you from my first week at your firm. I didn't realize it at first, but I started having feelings for you too. I tried to resist because of Renee. I grinned. I guess that problem solved itself. She kissed me again and we sat like that, cuddled together until I glanced at the time. Hand in hand, we walked up to the check-in counter. The flight attendant at the counter smiled, marking us off her list. You two lovebirds can begin boarding in a few minutes, she told us. As we stood waiting, Maddie looked at me curiously. You told me about Renee, but what happened to Hoffmeister? Do you know anything about him? As a matter of fact, I do. After the divorce, I had to contact old man Baker to arrange for the firm's check to be deposited into my account. When I did, I asked him about Vance. Frankly, I think he wanted to tell someone what he had done to Hoffmeister. Anyway, he said that Vance was doing research for the firm in the Aleutian Islands. He also said he planned to bring the guy home when it was time for his wife to give birth. But as soon as mother and child are safely out of the hospital, Hoffmeister will be off on his next assignment, in Kazakhstan, near the Siberian border. Maddie shuddered. What a vindictive old man, not that I feel sorry for Hoffmeister. At that moment, the loudspeaker announced that our flight was ready to board, and Maddie and I started down the ramp together. The steward led us to our seats in first class and stowed our bags. He then brought each of us a glass of champagne while we waited for the other passengers to board. Maddie took a sip and sighed. I could get used to traveling like this, as long as you're sitting next to me. Then she leaned back on the armrest and rested her head on my shoulder. Seeing her so happy made me feel better than I'd ever felt in years. Then she looked up at me with an expression I couldn't understand. You didn't mention Amber. What happened to her? Well, because she helped us so much as part of the settlement agreement, I got Baker to agree not to fire her. And he kept his word. She's still working at the firm, but they're keeping her on a short leash. Maddie gave me another cheerful look. You know, if you were going to ask someone to leave with you like that, I'd think it would be her. I mean, she's so pretty and all. I shook my head and smiled. Maddie, you're the one who makes me happy, not Amber. And unlike her, you're beautiful inside and out. She hugged me tightly again. Good answer, Squire. Besides, I added, Baker told me something very interesting about Amber. What's that? Do you know how she took the money so her sister could have the operation? Yes. So, Baker told me that Amber doesn't have a sister and she never paid the money back. Later that afternoon, I put my arm around Maddie's shoulders and we walked to the water's edge. This is why I wanted to come to Costa Rica. It's really beautiful here. I'm so glad we're here. But it wouldn't be half as beautiful if you weren't here with me, Maddie. She pulled me even tighter to her and rested her head on my shoulder. We stood in silence and watched the sun disappear into the Pacific. Then she timidly raised her eyes to me. Remember that thing we saw in the video in Houston, Squire? Why don't we go back to the villa and try some of that? Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.